morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. A couple of notes to get out of the way. One, I was able to travel to lovely Vitaly this morning by way of Crosstown Parkway. And please save the date, September 28th, 2019. We're gonna have probably one of the biggest parties the city ever has. And we're gonna open the bridge so that you can take Crosstown all the way to US 1. So you, you probably wouldn't evacuate that direction. Everyone's gonna be evacuating the other direction, but know that uh, you can get there when, when you want to, the US 1 and then ultimately the beaches. The other thing I wanted to share, some of you may know that in my spare time, I like to uh, rescue stranded motorists. And uh, I had the, the good fortune, I had the, the honor of rescuing a Vitalian a couple weeks ago right here at the clubhouse. Their car wouldn't start, so I came out here to give them a jump start. And uh, she's like, I can't believe the mayor came and saved me. I was like, well, you never know who's gonna rescue you, and uh, it's always a pleasure to serve a Vitalian. And she said, oh, mayor, I'm Irish. I <laughs> So if you're new to the neighborhood, it's Vud, Vitalian. Of, I call you Vitalians. You guys have the best nicknames in the city. You are Vitalians, and we love our Vitalians. And one of the many reasons we love our Vitalians is because how involved you are. So even here, after Easter, after the, the peak of the season, we have a room full of residents working to make their city, their world, a better place. And we thank you for that. Please give yourselves a big round of applause. No, I mean, go big, you're on, you're on film. This is gonna live forever, you gotta, you gotta bring it. So, uh, you know, we shall always recognize our biases. You know, I'm, I'm biased as your mayor. Uh, but having, having recognized it, I'll just go ahead and, and say that we're really lucky to live in Florida and to live in Port St. Lucie in Florida. I mean, there's a long list of reasons why we're lucky. It's a, it's a low tax state, it's got a great climate can do things outdoors all the time. Port St. Lucie still has all the things that make Florida, Florida. You get the Florida lifestyle at best value. We're the safest large city in Florida. In fact, not only is our crime rate low, actual number of crimes this last reporting year, uh, we're the same level as 2001 when we had about 90,000 less people. So we're really working hard out there. Our school district is on the rise. They've gone from the bottom third to the top third. Our, uh, our city, Millage rate, tax rate's going down, our city debt is going down. So all things are kind of moving in the, the right direction. But as with everything, uh, nothing is perfect. You know, there, there is a price to pay for living in paradise. And part of that price here in Florida, part of the price of living on a peninsula that sticks out into a warm Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico on the other side, connected by the Straits of Florida, that has the Gulf Stream come out of the Gulf and wrap around the peninsula and come up our coast before it starts veering a little bit further offshore. One of the prices is tropical systems. We've already had a subtropical system this year. It's not even June 1st yet. Doesn't Mother Nature pay attention to our calendars? I mean, <laughs> the, the nerve. But she's the boss, isn't she? And one of the prices for living in paradise is that we have to deal with unwelcome guests you know, we welcome a lot of guests here, but we sometimes have to endure unwelcome guests from the tropics, all right? And that's, and that's a fact. And uh, I'm a lifelong Floridian, could leave, but never want to. Would love to visit New Mexico, but don't necessarily want to live there because I like seeing green and forests and the ocean. So really, really uh, love everything we have to offer. But as a lifelong Floridian, I've had to deal with hurricanes. And when I grew up, I was on the Gulf Coast of Florida in the Tampa metro area. And the Tampa metro area is kind of protected if you watch hurricanes. And I know some of you watch hurricanes, and some of you, some of you might be a little fanatical about it. I don't know. I don't want to point any fingers. But uh, what I would say is we watch this. We're concerned. And if you watch it, you look at the pattern. The panhandle gets hit all the time. Louisiana, the Gulf Coast gets hit. But to wrap around to Tampa is tough. And when I was growing up, we had a Hurricane Elena, and she just sat out there swirling, stationary, sending rain to us for a long time, but we never got the winds. So when I was growing up, I associated hurricanes with not having to go to school, uh, rain days, getting to play games with my mom, eating M&Ms and Doritos. And I didn't, I didn't really understand as a kid the devastation associated with hurricanes. 
But as I made that transition from childhood to well, young adulthood, because I wasn't necessarily an adult at the University of Miami, but my first day at the University of Miami where I attended college was the day that Hurricane Andrew hit. And uh, when my father lived in the Fort Myers uh, area of Florida, if you're familiar with that, with that metro area. And it was the day before I was to go to the dorms. The dorms first opened up. And I was like, Dad, come on. I'm, I'm 16, 17 years old. I know everything. And that hurricane's not going to hit. Uh, they never hit. They always veer at the last second. You know, we, but unfortunately, it was a bullseye. My, my very first day, I was supposed to go to the University of Miami. So obviously, my dad was smart enough not to take me and drop me off at the dorm with, you know, with my bedding and canned tuna fish. Although if I, the canned tuna fish would at least been a little, a little uh, preparation. Uh, and of course, Miami was devastated. And did anyone actually see the yeah, homestead? And yeah, yeah, so you know very, very well, actually. Yeah, so you're actually re really getting close to ground zero there. And of course, my wife is from my now wife. She wasn't my wife when I was 17, but uh, when I went to college. But she's from Cutler Ridge. And of course, she lost her, her and her grandmother. They actually they lived on the same street, and they lost their their roofs. And then once you lose your roof. You kind of lose everything, and you're watching your family photos float, float down the street in the stormwater runoff. And so, you know, you, you just learn that it's very serious, and Mother Nature is not to be trifled with. And even there, I, was, I personally was sheltered at the University of Miami because they did a wonderful job of cleaning up the campus, and I was too poor to have a car, so I couldn't drive and venture off that much anyways. But I will tell you that for four years, Anyone come from up north where you have snow and you, you clear the roads and you have snow banks? You familiar with that? Like if you have a really bad blizzard, you might have just 20 feet of snow. That's what the vegetative debris looked like in the whole Miami metro area for years and years because it took years to pick up all of that debris and then take it and dispose of it. So imagine 20 foot snow banks made of trees and roofs and wood. That's, that's what it was like in Miami for, for years and years after the event. So you, you learn the hard way. And then of course, we moved here from down south. I was living in Broward County and I moved up to, to Port St. Lucie in 2002. And the funny thing is I told my wife when we moved up here, I was like, babe, we're overdue for a hurricane in this area of the coast. You know, you can't predict these things. You have a certain percentage every year, but in, in the Treasure Coast, and you know why the Treasure Coast called the Treasure Coast, right? From a hurricane, sinking Spanish galleons that had gold in them. That's why we're the Treasure Coast, right? So our very, our very name, our very history is associated with hurricanes. But I said, babe, we're overdue for a hurricane here. Of course, I had no idea, no idea, sir, that we were going to have two in one year, back to back, while we were still recovering from Francis. We got Jean. Which one is that, by the way? It's Francis. So yeah, they were very, both very similar storms with large eyes, so I can't, I can't pick it off. Let's see if it says. Yep, Francis. Gene did a, a nice little loop-to-loop. -loop. Well, actually went south and, and, and back, and you're like, how could she even do that? But in 2004, we were pegged by two. So believe me when I tell you from experience, uh, it can happen. It will happen. And there's a great Latin phrase, right? Maybe Caesar was saying it before he went off to battle. You look like a guy that's had a few battles that she came out victorious on, by the way. Uh, fortune favors the bold. I like to think that fortune favors the bold who have properly prepared. So it's really vital that we prepare for unwanted visitors from the tropics. And we're just so proud of you that you are taking these steps and, and helping to lead our community and lead by example. So on behalf of your city of Port St. Lucie, our five-person city council, our 1,200 employees, and about 200,000 residents, want to thank you. want to thank the Storm Prep Committee for your hard work, and, and more importantly, the greater community of Vitalia. Thanks for doing what you're doing and being prepared for hurricane season. 
And uh, I, I know Christine is going to have a great presentation for you. If I could just share a couple of things based on experience, the, just the, the couple of things. Well, I know that you're going to prepare, and I know you're like an A student, ma'am, I can tell by looking at you. So I know that you're going to have a checklist, and you're going to get everything on that checklist, and you're probably going to go during the tax holiday because I know that you moved to Port St. Lucie in Vitalia, so you're very tuned into value, being value-oriented, getting the best for the lowest possible price. So I know that you're gonna use the tax holiday uh, in order to get all your supplies at the very best cost basis. But that being said, in response to Andrew, we changed our building codes in the state of Florida so that roofs don't fly off quite as easily, right? And that's out of our direct control now. Hopefully, you know, we bought in the right place and had the right code. After that, you know, if you have water, and if you can afford a whole home generator, if you can afford that, you're really, really, and you have the hurricane glass, and maybe you're doing belts and suspenders and going shutters too, and you have that, and you have your generator, you're really in excellent shape, okay? You really, you really are, provided you do the rest of that checklist too. I don't want to take anything for granted, but when it comes, and I've lived through a couple hurricanes. Actually, you know, you think as being in the city, you might get your power turned back on first. 21 days. 21 days without power. Uh, we were the last house on the transformer line, on a transformer that didn't have many houses. But you know what? We had a generator. So you know, life was pretty, you know, given the circumstances, it was pretty decent. But this is the thing I say to you and I say to the people at home. If you have a generator, Please make sure it's properly ventilated. Watch the news every time there's a hurricane. Someone is dying from carbon monoxide poisoning every single time, and that is 100% preventable. Heaven forbid that we prepare, we make it through the storm, and then we get killed, and we're dead, our family is dead from a silent killer. Please make sure that your generator has a proper exhaust, because that exhaust can go into your home and harm you and your family without you ever knowing it. So the generator's great. It's gonna, it's gonna make, it, heaven forbid, we have to deal with the storm. It's gonna make your life better. You're gonna be able to cope with it much better. But please make sure it's properly ventilated. Never run it inside. Never run it inside of your garage with the door closed. Don't even run it in the garage if it's anywhere near the door and far away from, from the opening. Please make sure it's properly ventilated. And uh, with that, I'm gonna try to stay to the very end so that uh, if you have any questions about this or anything going on in the city, I can hear from you. Really, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for, for preparing for hurricane season. Hurricane preparedness is a community effort. Why do we say that? When we prepare together, we can recover together, and we can get through any type of emergency that we have. If you and you alone are prepared, how does that help our community move forward, right? So I'm seeing everyone shake their head. It sounds to me that this community is happy and healthy and friendly towards their neighbors. And I think that's so wonderful and so important. So today, just to go over what we're going to go through today, uh, the hurricane season overview, basically just go through what we've seen over the last few years and what we're expecting to see this year. I want to go through four phases of emergency management with you to give you a good idea of how the city prepares and how that's related to the community preparedness as well. And then let's talk through how you yourselves are going to prepare. So who out here has already seen the outlook for this storm season? Okay, so there are several outlooks that are already out there that are produced by um, different universities, different channels and stations, but the National Weather Service is what we in the city really try to look at the most, and that is supposed to come out this week, so you're going to see that out in the news. They also push another uh, outlook out just before hurricane season peak time. So your peak time, August, September, and October. So do we know the difference between tropical depressions, tropical storms, and hurricanes? Okay, good. So a lot of it has to do with your wind speed, right? And the level of risk that it brings. So one thing that I want to go through with you during this presentation really is to show the difference between what these category storms are. Is a category one really kind of almost the same as a category two? And is a category three close to a category two? So some say yes, some say no. So we're going to go through that. 
What about the difference between a watch and a warning? So if you hear that you are under a hurricane watch, what should you be doing? Getting ready? So nobody in here said hurricane party. I love that. <laughs> love, love that. So many people, I think, uh, especially after we had the 0405 storms, what we saw was Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Irma were 10 years, 11 years after that. And I think that a lot of residents had that level of complacency where they, they hadn't experienced a storm for such a long time, they weren't as prepared as they could have been. And I, I truly feel that we were very fortunate that we didn't experience Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane Irma at those higher categories because they veered off at the last minute. So I think we were lucky. But as we know, it takes one storm, right? Like Mayor Orvac was talking about Hurricane Andrew. It only takes one. Hurricane Michael in the panhandle this past, uh, this past season. So this is some information I pulled from the National Weather Service. They gave a fantastic presentation yesterday to our city staff. And I really thought that you would enjoy seeing it because I did. So you can see the different tracks of storms here. And we're going to go month by month. And you can really see, just like Mayor Orbeck was saying, you, you see storms that happen just before hurricane season sometimes. But do you remember the three months I said were the highest and the peak of hurricane season? August, September, and October, right. So here's June. You can see at the top we have a couple, but they didn't really even come anywhere near us, which is great. And do you see the, the, uh, the years here? We're talking a big span. So that's a lot of data there between 1851 and 2017. Here's July, a little bit more. Here's where you see it start getting busy, right? So here's August. September, so we're seeing a lot more in September, and October. So October is very busy for us. So if we're in this area here, look at how many storms we've seen. So even though we're about to start hurricane season June 1st, if there's still some things that you have to do, please make sure you're doing them. I, I hear some people say, hey, we're not ready for this season. We'll make sure we have this by next season. But why not still prepare? There's plenty of time to still prepare. Make sure that right now you have as much supplies as you need, and we'll go through a little bit of that uh, at the end. Uh, up front here, there are some quick guides. It sounds like you guys have one as well, which is so fantastic. Uh, so the, the city has a two-sided quick guide as well for hurricane preparedness. So at the end, if you'd like to uh, take one of those, that would be wonderful. Maybe you could put it on your fridge. How about November? technically still in hurricane season, but I was surprised to hear that in all of this time, all these years, National Weather Service is saying we haven't had any type of major storms come through. So I thought that was nice data to share with you. Okay, so I think most of us are pretty familiar with the hurricane categories. Does anyone know what category begins the label of a major hurricane? Correct, category three. So category three, four, and five are all considered to be major category hurricanes. So I asked before, is a category one really that much different than a category two? Is a category two really that much different than a category three? Hey, I lived, I lived through a category two. I can do a three, no problem, I did it, right? No. So let's look at the difference of the wind speeds here. So you go from a category one, somewhere between 74 to 74 to 95 miles an hour, and you can kick all the way up to 157 miles an hour. So it's pretty different. You can see your levels of damage. You go from some damage all the way to extensive damage, devastating damage, and catastrophic damage. So just like Mayor Orvec was saying before, how do we prepare our homes? How do we prepare our families? So this shows the track of Hurricane Irma. And I mentioned Hurricane Matthew, and I mentioned Hurricane Irma, and how I felt we were very lucky. What category or what wind speed do you think we saw from Hurricane Irma? OK, so less than 74, category 3, more than 150. So surprisingly, and I think a lot of Floridians don't realize this, and that's why I love putting it in presentations, Although we were looking at a major category hurricane coming our way, it veered at the last minute, and the city of Port St. Lucie 
saw less than, less than a category one. So we had over 100,000 cubic yards of vegetation that the city of Port St. Lucie debris management picked up and made sure to get out of the roadways and bring to our temporary debris sites. 100,000 cubic yards for less than a category one storm. So if that puts into perspective, into perspective, what would a category three look like? So we're gonna have homes damaged. We're going to have, uh, if they're older, we might not see roofs on them anymore. We might see homes that are down. So we saw vegetation because the trees went down. A lot of people weren't trimming ahead of time. But it really just shows you the difference. And then this is, uh, this is Hurricane Matthew here as well. And you can see, so ye uh, yellow, we're in the yellow here. Do you see the actual track here is in red? So we just, just missed it. Okay, so this is two years ago when I first saw this from National Weather Service. This made my jaw drop. So I really wanted, I wanted to share it today. So major, major hurricanes, again, which are category three, four, and five, account for only 21% of all the hurricanes that make landfall within the US. Of that, they produce 83% of the damage. So when I say it only takes one, it's, that's very, very true, because you only have to have one Andrew or one Michael, right, one Sandy to really affect your area. And you'll see people say, we need to get back to normal. When you have a storm like that, are you getting back to normal? It's more of how can we get to the new normal? And what does the new normal look like? So this is what I really loved and I wanted to share with you. It shows the difference of damage from a category one to a category five. So you can see that's not a linear increase. That is going from a risk level of a one increasing 10%, 50%, 250%, all the way to 500% of damage. That's, that's insane. So the difference between a category one and a category five is 500% more damage. So that's why it's so important to be prepared. Who in here feels they're prepared right now for a category two? Okay, I love to see that. Let's get some more hands up, right? So what else can we do? And we're gonna run through that today. What about the size of a hurricane? Does the size of a hurricane matter? Some say yes, got some no's. What about the intensity? We know the intensity matters, but the size matters too. So this just shows you the difference in size between Irma and Matthew, your Francis, Jean, Sandy, Andrew. So look at how small Andrew was compared to Sandy. Did it still do a significant amount of damage? Absolutely. So the, so the size matters, but it's also your intensity, right? So this is why, this is why I want to show this to you. A lot of times you're going to have an area that is greatly affected, and you might have a bigger area that's affected by the size of a storm if it just sits on top of you. Who remembers the storm that sat on top of Florida and Port St. Lucie that just dumped rain for three days? You guys remember it? And, and that's what's tough a lot of times, is you see a storm that might only be a category one. It might be a category two. That's still very significant. It's still very dangerous. But on top of that, a lot of the danger that comes in is when we just see it rain and rain and rain, and it continues to rain. And I think the city of Port St. Lucie has a phenomenal drainage system and has the ability to lower water levels when possible, but if it's just pouring and we can't keep up with it, a lot of times the streets flood, and that's when you wanna make sure you're not outside driving, right? You don't wanna be in the streets. You don't wanna be driving around. So that just speaks to the flooding a bit. Flooding is not correlated with hurricane strength. Slower moving systems tend to produce the most extensive flooding because it takes them so long to get past your area. So I mentioned I wanted to talk about the four phases of emergency management quickly. So emergency management consists of mitigation, preparedness, 
response, and recovery. So I want to share with you what the City of Port St. Lucie's teams do on an annual basis, year round, and whether we have a storm or not. So if we don't have a storm, we're still focusing on mitigation. What can we do to lower our level of risk for our residents? We're still focusing on preparedness. And then if we do have an emergency, which would relate to either hurricanes or any other emergency that we have, we may activate our EOC, or Emergency Operations Center, and activate our entire response team. So how do we respond? How do we respond to a hurricane? How do we respond to uh, tornadoes or other weather incidents? And of course, recovery. And remember before, we mentioned that recovery sometimes is getting back to, do you remember what I said? The new normal. And what does that new normal look like? City of Port St. Lucie, I can tell you, we will pick ourselves up. It might take a while, but the residents that I've seen here, the community and the staff that we have, will work together as a team, and we will make sure that we're all on the same page and we're all working together to help one another. And I truly believe that. So, this is what our EOC looks like as far as staffing. We have a command staff, which consists of these individuals here. And then we have different sections. There's different sections that take care of different things. And the purpose of the EOC is to make sure that we are functioning as one unit to ensure that everyone out in the field who is helping in this disaster recovery effort is doing the best that they can to recover as fast as we possibly can. So this is what our EOC chart looks like. We might activate the entire staff, depending on what we have. If we have a tropical storm, maybe we'll only activate the planning section and the logistics section. If we have a Category 5, I can tell you this entire EOC, or Emergency Operations Center staff, will be activated. We'll be taking phone calls. We'll be pushing as much information out to our residents as possible. The communications department for the city is phenomenal. You can always find information on the city's website. This is what our EOC physically looks like, where everyone sits. And this is what I mentioned on how we activate. And why do we activate that way? So level three, we're just going to be monitoring for any type of potential escalation. A level two, we mentioned some of those sections will be activated. And a level three, or excuse me, a level one, we will be fully activated. So I want to share this so that you have an understanding of how you can receive information from the city's communication staff and emergency management team during an emergency. To give you an idea of how we communicate with the state and how we communicate with the county. So in emergency management, we call our schedule or our timeline a battle rhythm. So the battle rhythm needs to be the same every single day so that we can push out information to our residents at the same time every day. So the city's battle rhythm is uh, for all press releases three times a day. We want to make sure three times a day if we have an emergency you know what's going on. That's 8.30, 12.30, and 5.30. We take a call with the state at 11.15. 11.30 we talk to the National Weather Service. And then we want to make sure after those calls, we meet with our EOC or Emergency Operations Center staff so that they are all informed as what's going on as well. And then uh, depending on the strength of the storm, if we're talking hurricanes today, you'll see some at night as well at 5.15 and 5.30. So I think this is a lot of why you're here today. What do you need? A lot of that is on the Hurricane Quick Guide. But I think that no matter where you look, you're always going to see something different. They're all going to say, have a flashlight, have extra batteries, have food, have water. But here's the discrepancy. Some say 72 hours worth of food and supplies. Some say five plus days. So I think it's very important if, if you have the ability and if you have a pantry big enough, stock it. Why not, right? Have enough food, have enough water. I'd recommend having it for five days. So you'll see a video later uh, that the National Weather Service provided it saying 72 hours. I think the new push right now from the Florida Division of Emergency Management is a minimum of seven days. 
So what do you need? What do you need for your home? How do you prepare your home? Mayor Orvac mentioned shuttering or impact windows, right? What about for your family? Do you have a plan? Who has a plan right now for their family? Okay, so let's, let's think about that. Let's get some more hands up next season. Next season when we come out, let's put up all our hands. That would be fantastic. So what kind of plan do you need for your family? Do you need to know where you're going to go? If there's any supplies that they need. Each individual person might have different medications, different dietary restrictions, right? What about our pets? I don't want to forget that. Who in here has a pet? Okay, see, I wanted to get more hands somehow. <laughs> so, can we take our pets to the shelters? I love that answer, yes. So, uh, St. Lucie County is uh, in charge of sheltering. Through state statute, the county is responsible for being the lead agency, and the city falls um, within that. And we very much try to be as proactive as we can because we make up more than 50% of the county's population. But the county is still responsible for sheltering. So they do have one shelter that they open if there's an emergency uh, that they do take pets, which is fantastic. So I recommend making sure to know what the county shelters are, where they are, and just keep in mind that they don't always open all shelters. Sometimes they only open one or two because they might not need all of them. So, hey, I have a shelter two minutes from my house, it's great. That might not be the shelter that opens though. So it's, it's nice to know. What about evacuation? So we could shelter here or we can evacuate, right? How many people have seen the news coverage of all the cars on I-95 who get to sit through the storm? Right? So we don't want that. So if you do decide that your family will evacuate for a category two or higher, or a category three or higher, whatever your family plan is, don't wait. Why? Why would we wait? Because we're not prepared with a plan. So this is a fantastic time to evaluate your family for this hurricane season and decide what that plan should be. So we mentioned gathering food, water, medication. What about your important documentation? What if your house gets flooded and it gets ruined? It's recommended to keep it with you, have it in a Ziploc bag. And again, before you leave today, grab one of those hurricane quick guides. So this is uh, the service that I mentioned that the county offers is sheltering. So they also offer a special needs shelter for those of us who need to make sure that we still have power or electricity. For those of us who require oxygen, for those of us who require uh, assistance in a wheelchair or who, or who are bedridden. So that's something that we absolutely don't want to do last minute. So if you yourself or if you have friends, family, or neighbors feel that they need to go to that special needs shelter, please make sure to call St. Lucie County Emergency Management and pre-register. One other thing that St. Lucie County offers, we have this link both on the city's website and the county has it on theirs as well, is Alert St. Lucie. Has anyone heard of Alert St. Lucie? Okay, so a few of you already registered for it. So Alert St. Lucie is a fantastic service, but it is opt-in, which means that you have the opportunity to take advantage of it or not take advantage of it. So what Alert St. Lucie is, is an emergency notification system for different types of emergencies which you select. So I want to be notified of all emergencies. Check, 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 check. No, I only want to be notified of hurricanes. Check. I don't want to hear about all the rest. And on top of that, you can say I don't want to be notified after 9 p.m. I would personally would love to know if there's an emergency in my area no matter what time it is, right? <laughs> but I get so many calls from residents who are frustrated. Hey, I got a phone call, I got an email, I got a text message. I'm done with this, I don't want this anymore. So why I'm sharing this with you is because it's an opt-in system that gives you options. And I think if you take advantage of those options, you can select the emergency that you'd like to be notified for. If there's certain times, if you choose to be notified, so maybe you don't want to be notified at 12 a.m., that's okay. And then in addition to that, it allows you the opportunity to decide how you want to be notified. Do you want to be notified through an email, through a text, through a phone call, or all three? 
So me personally, I would rather see it on my phone. So my selection was a text message. And if I don't answer my text, they ask you to reply yes. So if I don't reply yes, I immediately get a phone call. And that's it. Does everybody understand that? I think it'd be a great system to take advantage of. Alert St. Lucie. Again, it's on the city's website and on the county's website as well. I'm sorry? So uh, the, uh, the link is on the city's website as well as on the county's website. So if you go to cityofportstlucy.com, you can go to emergency management, or you can go to St. Lucie County Public Safety, and it is on there as well. Yes, ma'am. It's also on the quick guide that we prepared. The one that's been How fantastic are you? You are so fantastic in this community. So it is on your quick guide as well, and I love to hear that. Thank you so much. I love hearing that. So just to wrap up today, we want to prepare as a community, right? It sounds like this community is more than willing to help their neighbors. Remember, your families, your plans for your homes, your plans for your pets, and reach out and help your neighbors if you're able to.